Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Thus, the Cuban Missile Crisis publicly began, resulting in a reaction that almost destroyed the world. Yet the crisis did not solely begin with Kennedy's speech. The true roots of the crisis go back to 1959, when Fidel Castro led a revolt in Cuba and overthrew the dictator Fulgencio Batista. Batista was an American line dictator, so his overthrow angered the Americans. Castro soon began forming ties with the Soviet Union and signed a variety of pacts with Nikita Khrushchev, allowing Cuba to receive aid from the Soviet Union. The United States eventually led a secret operation called the Bay of Pigs to sabotage Cuba. This operation eventually failed, but it persistently carried on throughout the crisis. In CIA Director John A. McCone's meeting with Attorney General Robert Kennedy on January 19, 1962, the Bay of Pigs operation was outlined by McCone. With these factors in mind, the Attorney General had a discussion at the White House during the autumn of 1961 with the President, the Secretary of Defense, and General Lansdale. The Secretary of Defense assigned Lansdale to survey the Cuban problem, and he, Lansdale, reported to the Secretary of Defense and their Attorney General, concluding, 1. Overthrow of the Castro regime was possible. 2. Sugar crops should be attacked at once. And 3. Action to be taken to keep Castro so busy with internal problems, economic, political, and social, that Castro would have no time in meddling abroad, especially in Latin America. However, what the United States did not know was that in secret, nuclear missiles were being shipped to Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. On Sunday, the 14th of October, 1962, uh, the U-2, which uh, uh, was uh, one of the continuing overflight and, and photography missions flown over Cuba in those days, came back with a series of pictures which for the first time provided uh, absolutely incontrovertible evidence that the Soviets were indeed installing uh, missiles, offensive missiles on, on the island of Cuba. The scariest part about this to the U.S. was that these missiles had ranges capable of striking Washington, D.C. and other major cities. Kennedy quickly put together the XCOM team, which was made up of some of the highest officials in the U.S. government. These people helped Kennedy make decisions in this time of stress and need. The XCOM team's hard work and negotiation with the Russians and Cubans are one of the factors that make the Cuban Missile Crisis a model for how international negotiations are expected to carry out in today's world. The XCOM team didn't just mindlessly react to the Cubans or the Russians. They took their time to think. And as he said a number of times to, to the Joint Chiefs and, and to others, uh, during the course of that 13 days, uh, what, would the, what will the Soviets do? Uh, presumably in Berlin, if we attack Cuba, uh, which, uh, which the military wanted, to, wanted him to do. Although many of Kennedy's advisors urged Kennedy to invade Cuba or bomb the missile sites, Kennedy refused. He wanted a major airstrike and then an invasion of, uh, of the island. And, and his concern was, yeah, if we do that, what, what's Khrushchev going to do? Instead, Kennedy decided to stop the incoming flow of weapons to Cuba by setting up a quarantine of the island. This way, the Soviets in Cuba could not gain any more missiles, and if any ship attempted to get past the blockade, 
they would be responsible for the consequences. Meanwhile, in Soviet Russia, Premier Khrushchev was in an awful fix. The Americans had discovered his missiles before he had transported them all to Cuba. This interfered with his plan, which was to travel to Havana, after all the missiles were transported, meet with Castro, and sign a social defense agreement sealed by the deployment of nuclear missiles targeting the U.S. To Khrushchev, an invasion seemed inevitable. Little did he know, the United States was strongly considering an invasion of Cuba at the time. Khrushchev's best and only method of survival during this time period was to intimidate Kennedy. In a conversation between Nikita Khrushchev and his son, Sergei Khrushchev, Sergei asked, How can you say that when we only have two or three? Two or three meaning nuclear missiles. Khrushchev replied, The important thing is to make the Americans believe that. That way we prevent an attack. Khrushchev had also attempted to intimidate the United States before the crisis through public displays, such as landing the first aircraft on the moon and testing the most powerful nuclear weapons before the United States. Despite his loyalty and trust of Khrushchev, Castro was not as confident and feared an invasion much more than Khrushchev did. He constantly urged Khrushchev to attack the United States before they made the first move. This was another miraculous factor of the Cuban Missile Crisis. If it weren't for the fact that they were dealing with nuclear weapons, Castro and Khrushchev would have fought a nuclear war in a heartbeat. Yet the fear of weapons so powerful kept them in line. On October 26, 1962, Khrushchev was forced to pull back his ships heading towards Cuba with offensive military weapons, seeing as the United States was not backing down with the quarantine. On October 26, secret negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union began in the form of letters between Khrushchev and Kennedy. In these letters, Khrushchev explained the Soviet Union's fear of the Jupiter missiles the United States had in Turkey at the time. The thing that, that, that uh, turned this for him was that fire, because he said, I may be losing control of this, you know. Things, there are people out there who are going to do things. There are accidents that are going to happen, and, and uh, that you two being shut down means I, I'm not conducting this, this conversation um, I don't have total control over it. After much debate, America finally decided to remove its missiles from Turkey. As a result, the Soviets broadcasted this message back to the Americans. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their crating and return to the Soviet Union. Although the Cuban Missile Crisis officially ended with the removal of missiles from Cuba, it continued to have a lasting effect on our world. The Cuban Missile Crisis was successful in avoiding destruction and war, two things humans have generally been terrible at throughout history. But, but he's, what is he focused on? Just constantly this dilemma of getting the missiles out of there but averting the final failure. And the final failure, those are his words, the final failure is a worldwide nuclear war. The Cuban Missile Crisis was also able to show the world had found a weapon that was finally able to scare humans away from war. Countries like India and Pakistan looked upon the Cuban Missile Crisis as a reason to obtain nuclear weapons in order to defend themselves. This reform will inevitably lead to more conflict as it is only a matter of time before small organizations like terrorist organizations gain and use these weapons without having to worry about mutually assured destruction, meaning it's quite possible nuclear warfare could occur in the future.